Good evening. Welcome to Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church for this fourth Lenten meditation. It is Wednesday, March 10th, 2021. Here at Zion, we have been looking at a theme during these Lenten meditations of places of the Passion. And this evening, the place that we'll look at is the Court of Pilate, a place for a substitute. May the Lord bless our meditation for a while this evening as we gather around God's word to prepare our hearts for that celebration that's coming soon, the celebration of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus. We'll follow the order of service in your worship folder this evening. A special welcome to you if you are a guest who's joining us through our website. Please note there is also a link there for our worship folder so that you can follow the order of our service. We begin now with our first hymn, number 103, Glory Be to Jesus. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name. Forgive our sins. Speak to our hearts. Dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word. And receive our hymns of thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue the reading of our Passion history according to the Gospel of St. Mark this evening, Mark chapter 14, verses 43 to 65. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. 
The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scripture must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days will build another not made by man. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. Here ends the Passion reading for this evening. We join together now in our seasonal response. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We continue with our next hymn, number 115. He stood before the court.
Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, the word of God that will serve as the basis for our meditation this evening are the words that are recorded in Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, reading the first 15 verses. Very early in the morning, the chief priests, with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate released or Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Waiting, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. This is the word of God. A pastor was once asked if he could summarize the entire Bible in just one word. He thought for a moment and then said, yes, I think so. And the word that he used was substitute. That word, that concept, looms large as we go to the place of the passion that we're visiting this evening. It is the court of Pilate, a place for a substitute. Now, our text tells us that we have now moved to early on Friday morning. You might recall that that terrible travesty of justice took place in the pre-dawn hours in the darkness at the high priest's court where they condemned Jesus to death. But now, very early in the morning, after they make their plans, those leaders of the Jew drag Jesus to the fortress of Pilate, pound on the door, rouse the governor, and demand that he give Jesus the death sentence. So now, Jesus is in the hands of Governor Pilate, a Roman, and he will judge him. It's likely that Pilate had heard about Jesus. I mean, he was a famous man in that land for doing all kinds of miracles. And it's likely that Pilate perhaps understood that Jesus had something to do with the Jewish faith. And likely, Pilate may even have wanted to talk with Jesus. But I don't think Pilate realized what he was getting himself into. Pilate could have just dismissed this entire farce. He could have just said, take this man out of here. But Pilate was kind of politically savvy. And he understood why they brought Jesus to him, that it was envy, it was jealousy, it was self-interest that motivated these Jewish leaders. And perhaps he thought he could take advantage of that to his own benefit, gain some concessions from them if he listened to this accusation and questioned Jesus a bit. And so he did. And he questioned Jesus both out in front of the people and privately. But what he found amazed him because he wasn't a political activist. Jesus was a man who was quiet. A man who he had determined was actually an innocent man. So Pilate's dilemma then was how to let him go and still do justice 
by these people who had brought him. Well, Pilate tried the direct route, first of all. He simply came out and said, I find nothing to put this man to death for. I find nothing even worthy of death in him. But that did not appease the people at all. So then Pilate sent him over to Herod. He found out he was a Galilean. And Herod questioned him and sent him back to Pilate with the same understanding that he was an innocent man. So that didn't work. So Pilate then thought maybe he'd draw upon the compassion of the people and he had Jesus flogged and the soldiers treated him in a miserable way, putting crown of thorns on his head, striking him again and again in the face with a rod. And finally they brought the man back to Pilate and Pilate presented him to the people as a miserably bloodied man, hoping that they would be compassionate and agree to let the man go. But again, the people were not appeased. They still demanded his death. Well, Pilate had one more ace up his sleeve. And that was the fact that there was a custom among the people at Passover that Pilate would release one of the prisoners to them. So Pilate asked them, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? thinking that they would definitely choose Jesus over the alternative that he was going to give them, and that was a man who was in prison as an insurrectionist, one who had in the uprising committed murder among the people, and his name was Barabbas. Surely the people would choose Barabbas and not, or choose Jesus and not Barabbas. But Pilate underestimated the hatred of the Jewish leaders for Jesus. And they went among the people and they incited them to ask for Barabbas to be freed to them. And so the people chose Jesus, or chose Barabbas as a substitute for Jesus. Bad choice. How could they be so evil, so insensitive, so stupid? They should have chose Jesus. Truth be told, however, we all choose Barabbas in our own life over Jesus all the time. For example, we get up in the morning, we get ourselves dressed, we have some breakfast, and then we go off to work, or maybe just across the living room right now to work or to our home office. We spend all day being busy at our work, and then we come home And we rest a little bit and maybe we eat some supper and then we maybe watch TV for a little time or watch some sports and then we go to bed. And not a single word do we look at in the scriptures. Not a prayer on our lips that day. We've chosen Barabbas as a substitute for Jesus. Or maybe... A young child is asked to do the dishes and she refuses to do the dishes. And Maybe your parents force her to do them and she does them but with a pout on her face, grudgingly and not happily. She has chosen her own Barabbas as a substitute for Jesus. Or maybe somebody thinks to themselves, I'm sure glad I'm not like all those other people. I'm not as bad a sinner as they are. After all, I... I take every opportunity to go to church or watch services online. I pray all the time. I'm not as bad as those people are. If more people were like me, we wouldn't have all these troubles in our world. They have chosen their own Barabbases as a substitute for Jesus. Or maybe somebody might say, you think George is weird? You should hear what Pamela did. Just wait. After work, I'll tell you all about her. That person has chosen their Barabbas over Jesus. Need I go on? Do I need to come up with all kinds of scenarios until one applies to each one of us? Or are we so brazen in our arrogance to think that we are above those people in Jerusalem, that we would never have chosen Barabbas in place of Jesus? Fact is that Lent is kind of a frightening thing for us. And it's frightening because during Lent we hear a truth that we don't like to admit and we don't want to face. 
This business of sin is a sad, dangerous, damnable business. And we are all in that business. Each and every one of us. And so as we come to this place in the Passion, it's not a happy place for us. Because every time we sin, like those people, we are choosing our Barabbases in place of, as substitutes for Jesus. Lent is also a time when we walk together with our Savior Jesus to the cross. And we do that by readings and then by pondering those readings and the people and the places and the messages that they give to us. And each year as I ponder these accounts of Jesus' suffering and death, I usually can associate or identify in my own heart with people like the apostles who fled or Peter who denied Jesus or the women crying at the cross. But I usually don't think of myself as a Judas or a Herod or a, a Pilate. And yet as I dig deeper into this passion account and the Holy Spirit convinces me that yes, even in my own heart, there is some of that Christ-denying Judas, some of that miracle-mocking Herod, some of that truth-denying Pilate. But can I, can I be a, a, a Barabbas? Am I a murderer? Are we murderers? I think you know the answer to that. Because you know the scriptures. And the scripture says whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Let's say that there was a camera on you all the time, 24-7. Kind of like a body cam but only in reverse. It's taking a picture of you every moment. And it sees all of your motions and it sees all of your moods. If we were to review that film, would we find some frames where there is anger in our lives about and towards somebody else? Maybe a parent who boils over at their kids because they've just crossed the line too many times? Or maybe an employee who's grousing about his employer because of the workload or maybe because of the way they've been treated? Or maybe a student who's silently cursing his professor because he piled on a big assignment during spring break. Or maybe a spouse who's getting angrier and angrier at the spouse's impatience or inconsiderateness towards them. You see, we can't hide those things because they're never hidden from God. He sees everything, just as Adam and Eve couldn't hide from him in the Garden of Eden. And so it's not just Judas's and Herod's and Pilate's, but also Barabbas's that we are. When we sin, we are choosing our Barabbas as a substitute for Jesus. And just like Barabbas, we are condemned and we are sitting on death row waiting for the eternal condemnation that we deserve. But in this place of the passion, God reveals to us that there is another substitute. We read, What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Jesus is the substitute. He's the other substitute. He took Barabbas' place on the cross. And here is the miracle of God's love for us that it wasn't just that Barabbas, but all of the Barabbases of this world, all of us Jesus also took our place. He was our substitute. 
The other day I was watching a show and it happened that there was a son who took the blame for his father who had committed a murder in the show. And so the son went to prison for his father and the son was going to be put to death through the death penalty in place of his father. But after all of the attempts at appeal were exhausted and the reality that he was actually going to be put to death came forward, the son appealed to the president for a pardon. Because suddenly, being a murderer and actually taking the penalty for a murderer was not something that he was exactly committed to doing. But Jesus totally and completely became our substitute. The scripture tells us he became sin for us. The scripture tells us that he took our curse in his body on that tree. God damned and condemned Jesus, his own son. And when God condemned and damned him, he was condemning and damning us. Jesus is our perfect substitute. Jesus' pains are our pains. Jesus' suffering is our suffering. Jesus' sins were our sins. And Jesus' condemnation and damnation on that cross was our condemnation and damnation. Our sins made us Barabbas's, but Jesus became our substitute on that cross. And just as Barabbas was therefore released when Jesus took his place, so also we are released because Jesus is our substitute. Released from condemnation, from the damnation that our sins deserve. Listen to this little poem about Barabbas. Barabbas in his prison cell gazed on the heavens fair and saw a paschal moon ascend in night's empurpled air. The hours crept on. With awe and dread, he waited for the morn. He heard at last the soldier's tread and saw the bolt withdrawn. Barabbas, so the soldier spake, I bring thee news of grace. For Christ, the man of Nazareth, today shall take thy place. Without the gate, shall Jesus bear the cross prepared for thee. Go thou to the atoning feast. The man of crime went free. Barabbas saw the darkened earth when came the hour of noon and slept in peace when Jesus wept beneath the paschal moon. O man of sin, that is Barabbas, in thee, I see myself redeemed by grace. The blood-stained cross that rose for thee took every sinner's place. That's how the poet said it. This is how God's word says it. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. A place for a substitute. There is no better place to be. Amen. In love for your substitute Savior, I invite you to bring your offerings.
You may give them in the ways described in our worship folder. And now we also offer our prayers to our gracious God and our Savior, beginning with praying together the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll pray the prayer of peace. We pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. We conclude our meditation with the singing of hymn number 116, In the Hour of Trial. Jesus, I will ponder now on your holy passion. With your spirit, me endow for such meditation. 
Grant that I, in love and faith, may the image cherish of your suffering, pain, and death, that I may not perish. We pray that you have been blessed through this time of meditation this evening on the passion of our Savior, Jesus. I invite you to join us again next Wednesday as we continue with our fifth Lenten meditation. The place of the passion we'll visit on that next Wednesday will be the place of the way of sorrows, a place of tears. Until we meet again, may God be with you.